I want to talk about the incidence. In, uh, bipolar is 1%, and this condition, be, we know only from the few studies that we have, we haven't got much, that this condition is at least 3%, at least three times as common. Three times as common, at least, that <laughs> I've seen figures of 20%, but at least three times as common. Most people agree with three, 3% 3 being the incidence of this condition. So it's more common, and it is a serious mental illness. It is as serious and as debilitating and as disruptive as bipolar disorder, and it should be covered by insurance as a se severe mental illness, and we'll have to find out if that's gonna happen, because I'm not sure if they, what they're gonna do, of course, is say no, because it's to their benefit, financial benefit, to first to deny, but eventually they're gonna need to cover this because it's a severe mental illness. All right, our medication protocol, uh, the medication protocol is not mine. It's, uh, it was a combination of the doctors that we work with, but what they are trying to do is to stimulate what they want to do is target medicine to the brain. And this is what NIH is trying to have everyone do, is to learn which piece of brain is involved. One of the problems with psychiatry is they don't diagnose diseases, they diagnose syndromes. They don't tell you where the disease is, they tell you just how the person is acting. Well, <laughs> there are many ways to act in different, with different diseases, so you really need to know what the disease is. And so what they want at the NIH, they want to know which piece of brain is involved and then target medicine to that piece of brain. Some pieces of brain need to be augmented and some need to be suppressed, but you need to know where it's coming from. And that's what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to say, what, what is going on? We think this, in this particular condition, there's bottom-up and top-down issues. Bottom-up means too much emotion coming out of the limbic system, particularly the amygdala, and we look to evaluate that piece of brain and to see if we can find evidence of too much activity, and then we try to stabilize that piece of brain, and we don't use antipsychotics, we use the same medicine they use for epilepsy, anticonvulsants that stabilize. But we use medicines the way neurology uses medicine, not the way psychiatry uses it. We, we try to follow the same, the doc I work with is both a neurologist and a psychiatrist, and we try to follow the same procedures that they follow in neurology. And we have a neurologist that we work with also from San Antonio, Dr. Seals. So if there's too much emotion, it's too easily triggered, too much electrical activity, we try to stabilize that. And if in the frontal lobe there's not enough uh, activity, not enough control, and there's some evidence to show, and we find that evidence routinely when we do the, uh, our exams, we do both uh, physiological exams as well as neuropsychological exams, if we find evidence of too little frontal lobe function, then we would try to augment that, to stimulate that, but don't use the stimulants they use for ADHD. Methylphetamine or dextroamphetamine, methylphetidate rather, or dextroamphetamine are two, the two kinds of stimulants they use for ADHD. They will stimulate the frontal lobe, but they'll also stimulate the limbic. And the kid will blow up more, not less, more. Then you need more antipsychotic to sedate more, you know. Don't use the ADHD meds until you've got them stable. Then you can come back and think about it, but don't, that, that, that's not the first step. First step is to stimulate in a way that does not stimulate the limbic. And so we use medicines that they use in traumatic brain injury to stimulate frontal function without irritating the limbic. And that has been very successful. So that's what we call you know, top down. We stimulate the top to control better and then we sedate, and not, not so much sedate, but stabilize the bottom, the limbic, so there's less of this excessive motion and more of this control and we get very good results with that. So that's, that's, the, that's the medication strategy. So I depend upon the psychiatrist because I don't believe you can stabilize this condition with any type of, no matter how intense, psychosocial intervention. I think it's, in, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to stabilize. You will, you will not be able to get him to stop exploding just with psychosocial, no matter how good you are. And I don't care how, I mean, you may be the greatest therapist, the greatest behavior manager, the greatest everything. It doesn't make any difference. If that's all you can do, if you're not gonna be having medication be part of it, they'll leave with, a, they'll still be exploding. They'll be better, 
but they'll still be exploding. You will not stabilize, you will not stop it. We don't consider it a success unless they stop exploding for a year. Then we know we fixed it and they stayed fixed. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, they're improved, but they're still having the same problems. You haven't really stopped the condition until you use the medication to stabilize, uh, one second, and then add your psychosocial interventions. I just wonder what, what uh, constitutes an explosion. What constitutes an explosive episode? Yeah. Well, the way I look at explosive episodes is somebody has to get hurt. Okay. It's not enough to just kick the, kick the wall or throw something at me. I have to bleed <laughs> or have something broken or bruised, not just a slap, but a bruise. It's gotta leave a mark and then I've been assaulted. And to me, that's, that's the kind of physical aggression I'm talking about. Now, there are some people who define aggression as anything verbal or physical. If I threaten you, they call that aggressive. You know, it is, but it's not the same thing. <laughs> When they go off, they will threaten you. Trust me, they will, they will threaten you. They'll threaten to blow up the whole school. They'll stand up in the middle of a class and threaten to blow up this whole building. And then when they finally get out of this and they get over this thing, they will not remember having said it. They will not have any clue how you blow up a building. They won't make a bomb. They don't know nothing about it. And they never do it. The ones who, who come into school shooters, they don't tell anybody. <laughs> they don't stand up and say, I'm gonna blow up the school. They don't tell a soul. They just play in it for a year like a military operation, and they come and do it. It's a different kind of aggression. It's premeditated, not explosive. Explosive is immediate. There is no delay. You don't go looking for a weapon. You, have, you may pick up a chair and it hits you, but you don't go looking. It's, it's just right there and then that you're going to just grab. Whatever. That's why I say don't have sharp pencils. Use markers because they're weapons. Anything you take a look around your room. What can you be, what can you use, I can, I can, I can hurt somebody with this handbag. I mean, you don't want to have anything in the room with these kids that can be made into a weapon or used as a weapon because they're not going to go looking. They don't hide shivs like in Brooklyn, they hide them all over the room. Not, this is not Brooklyn, they, they just immediate reaction. So it's very immediate, it's very uh, furious, hugely furious, and it's life threatening. They are going to try to kill you. They're not. <laughs> What they really want is to get rid of you because they see you as the threat. This is not Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, they're offensive. They want to hurt you. <laughs> they want something from you. They want to, you want to give, give up your turf, give up your territory, give me your wallet. I had to pay to go to the bathroom in my, my high school <laughs> until I joined the gang. Once I joined the gang, then they paid me to go to the bathroom, so it helped a lot. It's a long story. But <laughs> It, there's a big difference between premeditated, offensive aggression, which is usually premeditated and planned, and usually there's mean kids that do the bullies and whatnot, gang members, and this impulsive, explosive aggression, which happens immediately and is furious, and usually will cause damage. Now, some of these kids will kick holes in walls, and that's that's obviously if you trash your room, that's, that's a problem. But I don't worry about that so much. If they're, if they're not hitting you, they're hitting the wall, they're still in control. <laughs> if they're using verbal but not physical, they're still in control. I'm okay with that. I don't like to be told what to do with myself, but you know. <laughs> but I'm happy that they're not hurting me, but if they're hurting me, that's a problem. Okay, so I consider it a problem if there's a physical injury, and that, to me, that, that to, to us is a clinically significant explosive episode. You had a question? What about intermittent? Uh Intermittent is not chronic, so we don't deal with that. Intermittent explosive disorder, first of all, is not child, child onset. It is episodic. Intermittent means episodic, and so it's not chronic, so we're not, it's not the same thing at all. It's a completely different condition. It doesn't require you have it for a year. You can have a, two of those a year and still be diagnosed intermittent explosive. It's intermittent. It's every once in a while. So every once in a while, you go postal. That's not the same thing. <laughs> and by the way, going postal is not explosive. It is more planned. They only take out the ones they're mad at, and then they kill themselves. It's part of uh, suicide. It's like terrorists. They kill, kill you, and then they kill themselves. It's, a, it's planned. It's premeditated. It's nothing to do with this condition. You had a question? Um, yes, on, on his question, what's the length of time normally that, that they will show this aggressive state? <laughs> Depends on what you do. Okay. If I'm over here, and he is now going into this aggressive state, uh, and we call it a rage, if he's going into that rage, and I can see the face, and I'm gonna show it to you in a minute, that tells me that he's going into a rage. I don't have to know anything, I just look at his face. And I can see he's going into a rage. 
He is defensive, not offensive. He is defensive. I am the threat. He suddenly, click, the amygdala doesn't know. It turns off the whole brain, and you're now dealing with the amygdala, which is the size of, a, of an almond. And that's who you're talking to. And the amygdala can only, only all the amygdala can do is, is call your names and threaten you and, and tell you, I'm going to tear your eyes out. It doesn't have a very good vocabulary. And it's not a conversation. There's no good give and take. You're going to have a very limited conversation. <clears throat> and you'd have, there's nobody home. There's nobody to talk to. So if you're going to follow your, this, the classic crisis management, you're going to verbally de-escalate. Don't do that. <laughs> You'll wind them up. They don't wind down. They only wind up. If you come close, they'll get more stressed. If you call for a show of force, these are not gang members that give up. They get more aggressive. <laughs> Everything they tell you to do is the wrong thing. Don't touch them. Do not put your arm around them and say, let's talk this over. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Picture a Halloween cat. Big back. Back. Big tail. Teeth. Claws. You're going to put your arm around that cat and say, let's talk this over? You know, you're not going to touch that cat. You're going to get scratched. I guarantee it. You will get scratched. That, the moment you touch this person, you will be assaulted. The moment. If you approach them, you'll be assaulted. If you talk to them, you'll be assaulted. Don't do any of those things. You are the threat. This person is the threat for this person having this. I'm the threat. They don't want to hurt you. They really don't. They want you to go away. They want to get rid of you. You're the threat. The amygdala says, go away. He says it by saying, I'm going to kill you. But, or throwing something at you. But they want you to go away. So if you go away, you're less of a threat. If you take your hand out of your pockets and you show them there's nothing in your hand, you're less of a threat. Anything that you can do in your makeup, making yourself less of a threat, look less big. Can you do that? Can you just not, not look so burly and muscular and like, you know, don't so be so macho because that makes you more of a threat. Anything that you can do to make yourself less, I wouldn't, I would find a door. I don't, I don't like to get cornered. So I back up real slow, real slow toward the door because I'm making myself less of a threat. And I can always escape if I have to. But I'm making myself, this person's going to wind down. And it takes five minutes. And that person will wind down. And then wake up as if they've had an emotional seizure. And they say, what happened? And they have very little recall. And they're tired. <laughs> like epilepsy. They just don't know even what happened. They can't hardly remember what happened. It was an episode. It was an episode. The amygdala took control. And the thinking brain was not working. And it takes five, ten minutes at most if you're not a threat. But if you talk to them, if you approach them, then it's going to take, if you touch them, if you restrain them, you'll be sitting on them for an hour, maybe two. Depends how strong they are. Until they run out of steam. Don't restrain them. Unless you absolutely have to for safety. There's nothing you can do. You know, they're killing somebody. You've got to figure something, sir. So they don't exhibit any hurt toward themselves? Or they? they do stupid things, like jumping out of a moving car. I've seen, I don't know how many of kids who have tried that. They do things that don't make any sense. They run across a highway with traffic. It's, it's, the amygdala is not very smart. But it's not like they go and try to hurt themselves. That is usually not the case. But as soon as they get a weapon in their hands, like a piece of glass or something, they, then everyone gets, gets worried. <laughs> but they usually are not, they're not suicidal. This is a different population. They're not even trying to hurt themselves like the cutters, the slashers. They are using it to, to defend themselves. You are the threat. They're defending themselves, so they want you to back up. Now, if you don't back up, they may approach you, and this is a way to get you to back up. But if you stand your ground, <laughs> then you'll get hurt. They will assault you. All right, let me show you the face, because they're so cute. They're just so darling. <laughs> I can't tell you how fun, fun it is to watch this, except <laughs> you have to know what you're doing, because it's extremely dangerous to be in the same room with one of these. There he is. This boy is the cutest thing. He's, <laughs> I just love this face. He's mad at you. I mean, is there any doubt that he's mad? This is, this is classic, universal mad face. It's mad face. Eyebrows are down, lips are tight, very quiet. He wants to hurt you. I don't know what you did. <laughs> I don't know what you said. Whatever it was, he'd like to hurt you. He's in a dream about hurting you. He's going to think about it and plan it for a couple of days because he wants to hurt you because he's really mad. I don't know what you did. Whatever it was, he's mad. This, now use all your crisis management procedures. It works great. Talk him down, you know, verbal de-escalation. Go right ahead. It works nice. You still have a relationship with this kid. 
you still have it. His cerebrum is still working. He's gonna, he had, the reason he hasn't assaulted you is because there's something he's thinking, maybe I better not do that. I might get hurt, maybe you're bigger, maybe I'll get in trouble, you know. He's still thinking. He may be plotting, <laughs> he may be planning, but he's still thinking. He is still able, you can, do, you can deal with this. This is, this is, ver, this is your regular de-escalation crisis management. There's another one, tight lips, quiet, eyes, slanted slides, you know. It's a classic, classic, just angry kid type of thing. This is my kid. You can see it immediately. It's so different. This is a kid who has crazy eyes, dilated pupils, flared nostrils. Oops, where, is, where am I? Oops, go back. Flared nostrils. Oops, quit that. And teeth, jaw clenching. He can't help it. The amygdala makes the jaw do that. Does it, by the way, with all mammals, not just my boys, my girls. All mammals will jaw clench. He'll show you the teeth. It is part of the amygdala's fight or flight syndrome. And he is out of control. The amygdala is in control of his brain. He, you have no more relationship. He is now getting very strong. And he, is, he, is, he wants to kill you because you are the threat. This is a defensive rage face. He wants to get rid of this threat, you. It's as if you, you are trying to kill him or his loved ones, and he needs to do anything to get rid of you. This is what you see when a cat is chased by a dog into an alley and, and is cornered and turns and becomes ferocious. And, and, and can, that, that can save the, save the cat's life to become ferocious and to show the teeth and display the weapons and have, make themselves look bigger with the, with the big tail. Very classic, M tight muscles, flared nostrils, jaw clenching, crazy eyes, dilated pupils. You're gonna see that every time. That's the first thing the amygdala does. Every mammal, not just humans.